That being said, I'd like to introduce our next keynote. Mr. Jim Sayer. Jim joined Adventure Cycling at the end of 2004, and with his family, he relocated to Missoula, where he's the president of Sierra Bicycle, where he was the president of Sierra Bicycle Council. Previously, he directed Greenbelt Alliance in San Francisco Bay Area, where he was the senior legislative assistant in Washington, D.C., for Senator Tim Worth. Jim was drawn to adventure cycling because of the, his major enthusiasm for cycling and self-propelled transportation. He serves on the board for America Bikes and is the founding member of Bike Walk Alliance for Missoula and served on the boards of Amnesty International USA and the Giada Segan Fund for the Rights of Women and Children. So we're really excited to have him here. Let's give him a round of applause, have him come up, and thank you so much, Jim. Is it on? How, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, it's really an honor to be here. And I know everybody says that, but this morning I got to go on a bike ride with about a dozen people, and it was great. Uh, it was fantastic to kind of cruise through the streets of Nashville and then come back on one of these awesome greenways. So, so anyways, it is great. And it's just great to be around other advocates, other folks that are working to make not only better biking and walking, but really, by extension, better communities. So I've been at Adventure Cycling for nine years now. I uh, had a great three days in Chattanooga. I'll come back to in a sec. But uh, it's just been an amazing last three to four years. Uh, I want to share some, some images. Uh, there are going to be a lot of them, but hopefully they'll inspire you to travel by bike. How many of you are uh, members of Adventure Cycling? That's great. So about a dozen of you. Thank you so much, because much of what you're going to see here is because of you and your support for the organization. How many of you have ever done a bike trip of any length, like one night or multiple nights? So yeah, one night, I see a hand go up. At, OK, that's great. There's about half of you, maybe. So the other half, I want you to feel inspired to try out a bike, bike trip. So anyways, let me come back here for a sec. Um, about four years ago, my whole family, my three daughters, my wife and I, did the entire Pacific Coast. Um, we've actually been traveling by bike since the kids were really little, around five. But anyways, we did the whole Pacific Coast from border to border. Uh, then the next year, my teen daughter actually liked it so much, she went with me solo all the way from Missoula to Astoria. It's about a 700-mile ride, and we did it in just nine days. And then, this was really inspiring for me. I'm in the middle of, do you know where this is? It's the Underground Railroad Memorial in downtown Detroit. Motown wants to be bike town. They are striping bike lanes like crazy. But this is part of our Underground Railroad bicycle route, which we unveiled two years ago. And then about a year and a half ago, I went to Europe. Um, <laughs> this is actually, do you guys have a Tweed ride here? Anybody, you have a Tweed ride? OK, at least in Chattanooga, right? So anyways, this was from the Tweed ride in Missoula, not really from Europe. But um, I got to ride the whole Rhine River, or not, not the whole Rhine River, a chunk of it. And they're rebranding that, redesigning the bike path there so it can compete with the Danube, which is the most popular bike tourism destination. So I got to do part of it. I got to do a national mountain bike route with my friend Lucas Stadher. He's the coordinator for national bike routes in Switzerland. They actually have three national mountain bike routes. So they have these little signs poking up in the middle of nowhere in these cow fields out in the Alps. You know, So uh, I got to do that with him when I went over to Europe. Got to go on the other Alps on a road ride, and then went to the Adventure Travel World Summit, which is an amazing gathering of the fastest growing sector of the whole travel and tourism market. This is a real opportunity for us. Well, anyways, they want to up their game because they see more competition coming. Last a year ago, January, I went to Toronto, where they unveiled the Great Waterfront Trail that runs along the north shore of Erie and Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. So, we got to ride Bixi bikes uh, in the middle of this wonderful storm. I think it was zero degrees that day. Uh, but uh, these are the coordinators for this, and they are trying to make Ontario a major bike tourism destination. The next month in February, I actually went to Tucson, where I thought it was going to be sunny and warm, and it snowed for the first time in six years. <laughs> so so uh, you know, I was trying to take a, abuse my position, but I failed. Uh, <laughs> but anyways, they were also interested in boosting their bike tourism profile, too. The next month in March, I met with that guy in the middle, Sam Farr. He's congressman from Monterey and Santa Cruz, and he's the head of the Congressional Tourism Caucus. And he is a major proponent of promoting active travel, especially in his district, which Monterey, Santa Cruz. They're building a really sweet bike path 
right between those two cities, 50 miles right along the Pacific Ocean. The next month in April, about a year ago, I went with my daughter up to Moab, uh, Utah. Anybody been there? Mountain biking? A little bit of mountain biking going on? So a, a dying uranium mining town that then restyled itself as a major bike tourism destination. But other places were catching up with it, so just in the last couple of years, they have created a whole new set of trail systems to try and maintain their lead. You kind of hear where I'm coming from? So anybody know where this is? This is in the south. Yep, Savannah. Who, I don't know who said it. Whoever said it? Who said that? Right here. These are adventure cycling postcards of our route. So, <laughs> see? A little swag here. So, uh, just remember. So, anyway, Savannah is my daughter Lucy. Last year, she and I decided to try the south for riding. We did an adventure cycling tour from Charleston to St. Augustine. Um, and we got introduced to southern cuisine in a big way. This is, <laughs> this is crispy brown buffet. <laughs> In Reedsville, Georgia, $8, all you can eat. And so I, this, this is my plate. It's Lucy's over there. But I ate two of those plates for lunch. And then we brought our tour group back over for dinner. Oh, it's disgusting. And it was $5 for senior citizens. <laughs> they had never seen the people in our group over 60 or two, and they had never seen them eat so much. You know, <laughs> that's pretty funny. But we also got things like we don't get where I live in Montana. We don't have signs like this. Uh, you know at our campground in Reedsville. But it was really beautiful. Back country roads in Georgia, South Carolina. And then we got down to Florida after that. But we did see a lot of small towns. And another theme is that bike tourism can be the salvation of small towns. I mean, really, uh, just that little boost that you get from those visitors who spend more than the average tourist. So this is Nehunta, Georgia. And that's Blanche, who runs the Knox Hotel. But we finally got to Key West. We rode all the way from Charleston to Key West last May. And then, just a few months later, my other daughters and I rode over the highest paved pass in Wyoming and with uh, Montana. It's 11,000 feet, called Beartooth Pass. Gorgeous place if you want to try it. But the two towns that bracket that, Red Lodge and Castle, uh, Cook City, which is right at the gateway to Yellowstone, have reported more cyclists than ever doing this route. It's a hell of a route, 7,000 feet of climbing. Uh, and we did it both ways. But um, it's been amazing. But what really brought it home to me was his last six months. Um, we've been doing a lot more in the South. Um, I went to the North Carolina Bike Summit where they unveiled version 2.0 of their state route system. Um, met a couple of adventure cycling members I'll come back to. The next day, literally, I went to the Georgia Bike Summit in Roswell, just north of Atlanta, and met with Robin Elliott, who runs great, uh, uh, I think, uh, what's it called again? It's Georgia Bike Adventures, Georgia bike Adventures and Atlanta Bike Adventures. Um, and then the guy on the left is Bruce Green, who develops new tourism products for the state of Georgia. And so they're very interested in getting more active travel uh, products developed. So he was at the conference, heard my presentation. The next couple days, we did tours all around Atlanta. They've had their most prosperous year at Atlanta bike tours. Um, and Robin's in this picture, too, uh, in their six years of operation. Then I shot right up to Quebec. Anybody gone riding in Quebec? Nobody? One? OK. So one person has gone up to Quebec. It is the gold standard for bike tourism. If you want to go somewhere and see what a really great integrated system is for bike tourism with a hospitality system, go to Quebec. So first time in nine years, they did a conference, too, on bike tourism with their Minister of Transportation, their Minister of Economic Development. And the whole idea is they see competition coming. They want to up their game, too. So very exciting. And then I went out into the countryside. The guy on the left, you can't really make it out. I wish I'd show you another picture. He has this massive handlebar mustache. He's the funniest guy. He's the mayor of St. Honoré. His town was saved by bike tourism because they extended rail trails up to his town. And now they're just seeing flocks and floods of tourists coming just to do day rides in, in their town in Quebec province. A couple other indicators for you. New York Times Travel Show, biggest consumer travel show in the US. We got about 25,000 people coming through. Jim Johnson from Bike Tours Direct right here in Chattanooga and I and our staff shared a booth there. It was the first time they'd ever had active and adventure travel featured as part of the New York Times show. So it's not just it's not just cruise ships and shuffleboard anymore. They're actually beginning to promote active tourism. So Exciting to see. This was the cover of the New York Times Magazine when they did the show. You can see the bikes on the front on a beach in Brazil. And then, this Sunday, I got to go to Chattanooga, which was really a treat. I've never been in Tennessee before. Uh, I got to ride the public uh, the share bikes, thanks to Phil. 
and uh, it was awesome. We got to go to Hogjowl Road. Anybody been there? <laughs> that was a courtesy of Jim. He said, we got to go to Hogjowl Road, and it is a really neat cycling road, and he's promoting it as a bike overnight destination just south of Chattanooga. And that's Marianne Fowler from Rails Trails Conservancy. We did a little speaking tour in Chattanooga. And then I'm gonna see how this works. It's gonna be a little jerky, but I don't wanna go the other one. The next morning after this, I uh, did a ride. First thing in the morning at sunrise. Yeah, it's a little jerky, but you'll get the gist. Anybody know where this is? Except for you in Chattanooga, don't say. What? Nope. Well, maybe. I don't know. Would that be fair, Would it be fair to say Chickamauga? It's a river, it's a river park. And uh, I did a ride at sunrise. I'm heading east, I think. Is that right? Towards the, uh, towards the TVA dam, the Chickamauga Dam. So you were right. You are right. All right. <laughs> well, Chickamauga is everywhere. You know, we went to the, we went to the battlefield. And so there you go. Anyways, it's kind of jerky, but it was pretty awesome. You should not do this with your iPhone while you're riding along. But this is bike tourism. Because, you know, I, I came to Chattanooga spending money and just enjoying this amazing facility that goes right next to the river. And, uh, yeah, forget that. We'll just skip it. But uh, I ended up at the, at, as you can tell, it says dangerous waters everywhere. That was sarcastic. And, it, and it's locale. It's landscape. And uh, so you got the beauty. You got the bird life. You got the incredible fragrances of spring. And then you also got, you know, a sense of, you know, what has made Chattanooga what it is today. And then yesterday morning, uh, Jim and I and a number of people got to meet with uh, the mayor of Chattanooga, Andy Burke. Is that right? And a uh, great meeting to talk about how to make Chattanooga a bike travel hub. And we talked also about how to you know, bring more US bike routes there, how to connect the Silver Comet Trail down to Atlanta. So really great meeting. So it's been an amazing last four years. My two takeaways from those four years are first, um, from the poet Mary Oliver, I don't know if you've read her, but she's an excellent poet. Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? So again, always that reminder, don't wait till tomorrow. Don't wait till tomorrow. If you have a dream, if you have an adventure you want to pursue, go for it. Don't wait around. You never know what might happen. And then the other thing is, for bike travel, the sky's the limit. It really is. I think there's a huge opportunity here, not only for bike travel and tourism, but for local advocacy. So let me give you a little bit of background on Adventure Cycling since about a dozen of you are members. This will be a quickie. We are the largest cycling membership group in North America. We have a little over 47,000 members. Anybody ridden the Missoula? Yes. So did we treat you like gods and goddesses? I don't remember. Did <laughs> <laughs> we get it? Well, that's true. That's true. What did you want? No, <laughs> kidding. No, you'll take your picture. We put, we put your picture up here on the front on the Wall of Fame right as you walk in the door. Free soda, free ice cream, internet. Uh, and also, uh, you know, we do train our staff to ooh and ah as you walk in, no matter how cruddy you look. Uh, <laughs> but anyways, we really love having visitors. It, the numbers have been going up year over year. We had about 1,200 visiting cyclists last year during business hours. We publish a magazine. There's copies on the table. Feel free to take one. It's a great magazine. Uh, it's number two in circulation after bicycling, but it's focused exclusively on bike travel all over the planet. So have one. Uh, we have a great new website and blog. Uh, it really puts out a lot of great material, and it's for everybody from newbies to veteran cyclists. So I encourage you to take a look at it. We're obviously on social media. We have about 65,000 friends and followers so far, actually more now, and uh, very interactive. So if you're looking for insider information, we also have e-forums where you don't have to do all the stuff you have to do on Facebook. You don't have to give away your identity, your life, pretty much. Um, and we have e-forums where you can get information from us, too. We run some tours. We tend to run tours that aren't like what you would see from a normal tour company. We run self-contained tours. That's where you carry your own gear, you cook your own food, and then you pay us for the privilege. It's a really good <laughs> business model that we do know. Actually, we provide the guide. We set everything up. It's a, great, it's a great tour opportunity. That's what my daughter and I did, Charleston to St. Augustine. And it's just a great way to connect with people and, and do something a little different. So we try not to compete with existing tour companies, but we run tours all over North America. This is Texas Hill Country. This is uh, our Cycle Vermont trip. This is North Shore, North, North Shore, North Rim of the Grand Canyon. And uh, that's van supported mountain biking. Only 13 people go. It's an amazing trip. 
I think you spend three nights right on the rim of the Grand Canyon. It's the less uh, developed side, so really beautiful. And we run cross-country self-contained and then supported trips. So you can go northern tier, Transamerica, southern tier. You can go down the coast, Pacific or Atlantic. And finally, uh, the last couple of things are we um, produce maps and routes, bike-friendly maps and routes. Uh, we've done about 42,000 miles of routes, so you'd have to ride one and a half times around the planet uh, to uh, actually do our whole route network, so get going. Uh, we have our Transamerica route, our coastal routes, two other Transamerica routes. We have the longest mountain bike route in the world, which is the Great Divide, and that runs from Jasper National Park. I don't know if this, oh yeah, it has right up there, all the way to New Mexico, Mexico border. It's the site of the most gnarly bike race I know of, the Tour Divide. 2,700 miles on dirt, over 200,000 feet of climbing, no support. So, you know, those Tour de France pansies, they, uh, <laughs> they, have, they, have, they have those big teams supporting them. They get break days. They get layover days. These guys just are against the clock. Self-contained, it's only what they can carry. Um, they can stop at towns along the way, but they're only about five. You know, it's like through the middle of truly nowhere. So, Tour Divide, look for it late June. It's an amazing race, and it's on our route. Uh, so these maps are really designed for cyclists. They are on waterproof, tearproof paper. They have cue sheets, panels. I'm getting a thumbs up here. Thank you. And they have services on the back. So in this little packet, you can have everything you need as a traveling cyclist, including grocery stores, libraries, places you can get internet access. Some of our most recent routes, Sierra Cascades bicycle route, which is 2,400 miles of really hilly goodness, even hillier than here. And it uh, goes through Yosemite, Mount Rainier, Mount Hood, all these really beautiful areas. An underground railroad bicycle route I mentioned earlier that goes from Mobile, Alabama, all the way to Lake Huron. Uh, it's an amazing route, too. Good riding and through a lot of rich historical areas. Um, we actually, we got asked by Detroit to come through there. Again, this Motown wanting to be bike town. So the actual, the original route goes from Oberlin and then goes up this way around Lake Erie. But they asked us to come up through, and we get them through Toledo, and then Ann Arbor, Detroit, and then this way, too. So now we have a new alternate route for the Underground Railroad. So it's been getting some really nice media, too, on uh, new bicycle routes to trace the Underground Railroad. Uh, we have five full-time cartographers that work not only on updating our existing routes, but creating new routes. Uh, so this will be out in March 2015. This is uh, Melissa, one of our cartographers, doing the geocoding along the route. So uh, they're out there actually doing the research. And then finally, the last route I want to mention is our Idaho Hot Springs <laughs> mountain bike route. This is a killer route in the middle of, not really a killer route, it's a great route in the middle of <laughs> Idaho. I know. I'm not trying to make it sound like this is a, you know, like a death march or something. But no, this is an amazing 500 mile loop in the middle of Idaho uh, near Sun Valley, Boise, Salmon, McCall, Idaho. It goes through some of the most beautiful untrammeled wilderness anywhere in the lower 48. And the best part is that at the end of the day, you can soak in a hot spring. There are more than 50 hot springs along this route that you can just dip into. There are some developed, but a lot of them are primitive. And I had promised Jim Johnson that I was going to give him our map set. The first printing sold out in three weeks. We had never had that happen before. Now, who else here is a mountain bike fan? Ooh. Okay, who's going to jump the highest to get this map set right now? <laughs> this is from the first printing. Come on. Yeah, all right. Woo! All right. Here you go. I like that. That was good. I wish, where was the photographer when we needed it? So, uh, anyways, that is an, uh, it's a really beautiful map, too. If you have a chance, ask Jim or Courtney uh, to look at them because they're really beautiful if you like maps. All the net proceeds from our work our map sales, because we are a nonprofit, just like Walk Bike Nashville, uh, go into our advocacy work. And it's to make better bike travel conditions in North America. So we advocate on issues like rumble strips, equal treatment of bicycles, um, access to Amtrak. We work as part of America Bikes on congressional lobbying. Um, this guy on the left, anybody know who he is? Peter DeFazio. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you were in Eugene, too. Uh, he's a congressman from Eugene, Oregon, and that's where they produce Bike Fridays. I don't know if anybody here has a Bike Friday folding bikes. You do? Great, Tom. Anyways, uh, he's also the only retired bike mechanic in Congress, which shows how far we have to go. <laughs> we, don't have, we have a lot of cyclists in Congress, but not too many bike mechanics. So Peter's a great guy and has been a major champion for us, and we're really facing some uphill struggles. There have been assaults on Tiger Grants. I won't go into it right now, but 
They have really been critical. I know Chattanooga is seeking one out for transit um, system study, and uh, we need support. So groups like this, I started out by saying I'm honored, but I'm also privileged to be part of a group that's going to really be active to support bike walk programs in the national level. Because this is where we don't want to go back to, people. You know, we don't want to go to where we are not only neglected but abused, you know. Uh, cyclists, have, cyclists have come too far to go back to this. And, and I'm going to give you my one little note of hope. I mentioned this at our mayor's meeting yesterday, is that the philosopher Schopenhauer said that, you know, all truth passes through three phases. First, it's ridiculed. Second, it's violently attacked. And third, it's accepted as self-evident. And, uh, and I think right now, when I tell people they get disheartened by all the crap they see in the newspaper or online about bicyclists, we're in the second phase. We're getting attacked. That's good. That means uh, that we're, we're relevant. We're actually being uh, considered serious, uh, you know, we're, we're going for that space, that public space I was talked about earlier, like in New York. I mean, that's what they called the video about, about this called contested streets, and that's really what it is. You know, we're trying to reclaim the public domain for cyclists, for pedestrians, for people. The last advocacy effort, United States Bicycle Route System. I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes, but we heard a great presentation on U.S. Bike Route 23 last night. And we're promoting bike overnights. So for those of you who have not done a bike trip, bike overnights, are, they really are the missing link between day rides and the more substantial touring experience. But you could do that tomorrow if you have access to a bike. And you actually do because you get seven days on, on bike share. I guess that would be kind of uncool if you took it for two days. Right? <laughs> but, uh, OK, so that's adventure cycling. That's who we are, what we do. So let me come back to the evidence that bike travel and tourism are booming and why this is important for us. First, we're seeing big numbers. Europe, I mentioned, they did a study a year and a half ago generating $57 billion a year in economic returns. $57 billion. Anybody here know how much the U.S. bike industry generates through bikes and accessories? $6 billion a year. I was showing this to some execs in the bike industry, and they couldn't believe it. But I said, a lot of it is day trips. That's OK. Day trips count, like that one I did on that that pathway. That is bike tourism. Quebec, La Route Verte is the Green Way. And they opened this in 2007. They spent $160 million to create this network of urban, suburban, and rural paths and, and trails and bike lanes. In the first year, they generated almost that much, 134 mil. And so they almost got a one-year return on investment. Wisconsin, generating $924 million a year from bike tourism, half of it from out-of-staters, half of it from in-staters. It's really a lot of money, and it competes with ice fishing, deer hunting. This was heresy. This was heresy. <laughs> this was heresy in Wisconsin. Everybody said, how could ice fishing be beaten by those guys in Lycra? <laughs> well, what's going on here? So, but when we go back to the DOT in Wisconsin, now we can say, look, this is nearly a billion dollar industry. Come on, why are you putting rumble strips on this road? Why are you doing chip seal on that road? Why? What, what's going on? Think. There's other states doing this. Oregon just came out with a study last year, 400 million. Montana, my home state, just did a study that said the potential is $377 million. To put that in context, the total tourism revenue that's generated in Montana is 3.2 mil a year. So over 10% could be generated by bike tourism. Again, it's waking people up to the potential. There are quarter studies available too, like on the CNO and Great Allegheny Passage. And we'll share this, um, by the way, with uh, the organizers of the conference in a PDF format if you want the info for your own use. Outer Banks did a study just showing tremendous return. And the key is that bike tourists spend more per day than the average tourists. So that's $98 daily on the CNO. Well, most tourists spend about 50 or 60 bucks because they can carry a lot more crap in their car than a cyclist can carry on their bike. So we have to spend more as we go along, right? It's true. It's actually true. So a uh, ski country in Colorado has fantastic bike paths. And so this is a kid's uh, tour that we do on the Colorado River and up in uh, Summit County, Aspen, Vail. And uh, they generate, and this is an old study now, I'm sure it's more, but over 200 million in the off season. So not as much as skiing, but quite a bit. Little towns. So for those of you who are concerned about rural Tennessee, Lanesboro, Minnesota, Southeast Dying Mill Town, 800 people, generates 25 million a year from the 60 mile rail trail network. That's a lot of money for a little town. 
And we have other examples on our blog. Farmington, Missouri created cyclist-friendly housing. It's actually the old jail they converted into housing, but you know, <laughs> we know, we know it's like, it's kind of funny. But uh, it's nice. It's on the Katy Trail uh, in Missouri. Um, Twin Bridges in Montana, town of 400, converted a chunk of their fairgrounds into cyclist-friendly housing with shower and everything. They spent 9,000 bucks to create that shelter, put out a coffee can. It's free. They generated 10,000 in donations the first year. So they paid it off, and everything else is gravy. All these cyclists are stopping, and they're going to the local restaurant, the hardware store. Amazing. So they're getting amazing returns on that little bit of investment. So that's the economic side, but then also countries, cities are creating fantastic cycle networks. The UK has spent over a billion dollars in national lottery money to create the national cycle network to connect all parts of their nation. Lottery. They're lottery. They use their lottery. So, you know, Colorado spends, um, spends their, some of their lottery money, a lot of it actually, on outdoors preservation or open space preservation and trail development. So it's not out of the question here. This is a Switzerland uh, example. And now that's Lucas with the map of all their national bike routes. Na they have paved and mountain bike routes. This is the North Sea Cycle Network, which connects the UK, the Benelux countries, and Scandinavia. It's already there and signed, 3,500 miles. You can go all the way around. If you had a pedal boat, you could do this little dot. <laughs> you could take the ferry too, but. Eurovelo, the European Cyclist Federation, our sister group in Europe, is working with the European Parliament and others to create uh, a 70,000 kilometer, 42,000 mile route network. So you go from Moscow to Madrid, wouldn't that be cool? Or London to Athens. So it just sounds kind of amazing, but it's about 50% done. What we're also seeing here is states in the US are creating their own network. So here's Oregon. They're creating official scenic bikeways all over the state. Texas, bicycle tourism trails, again, hooking into to history. And I can see lots of potential having going to Chickamauga and all these places um, where you have all these fantastic battlefield historic sites. And then the US bicycle route system. If you squint your eyes, you can see this integrated interstate system of bike routes. So this is really the mother of all bike routes that connects the city routes. That brings us all you know, into where we're trying to legitimize bicycling and bike travel. So isn't it, wouldn't it be cool to be able to go to the local corner and see, you know, for your kid or your grandkid or whoever, to see a sign that says it's two miles to downtown Nashville or it's a thousand miles to New York City, you know, and then you can go do those cycle tracks. <laughs> yeah, you laugh, but it's like, think about it. You know, it's like, it's just going to plant seeds in people's minds and say, wow, I could actually go on a bike, you know, that distance. You know, most people aren't going to do it, but it's just that you can. And that's, that's the excitement. So... Now, finally, the last indicator of how bike tourism is becoming popular is this. We are seeing agencies all over the nation begin to clamor to brand themselves as the most bike-friendly place. I want to show you this cool ad that was done. This should work better than the other video. Let's see. Can you hear it okay? cycling through Oregon. When he came across the young lady whose feet were constantly moving in circles too. And so their love affair began. Now these two will tell you there's something about seeing the world from the saddle of a two-wheeler. Things pass by just slow enough that you can see the colors and smell the smells, and taste the tastes, and greet the characters, and breathe the air makes for a guaranteed good night's sleep and a healthy appetite for hot coffee and each other. Now this journey will take several decades to unfold, but they can tell you one thing with some certainty. There are not many places in this world that you can dream of spending a good piece of your life on a bicycle, absorbing the wonders around you with your true love by your side, and actually pull it off. The naysayers will tell them to get a haircut, go to an office and spend their vacation in a car or a plane, lying around with an umbrella drink in their hand. But here in Oregon, people think the drinks taste better when your legs are sore, when your lungs are clear, and 
you plenty of inspiration for your next trip. So, what do you think? Yeah, it's pretty nice, huh? It's aspirational marketing. It's marketing to people based on their dreams and desires. Did you notice there were no uphills? <laughs> did you notice? Did you notice there were no cars on the road? No, 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 no logging trucks? No dogs? No pepper spray? No sweat? Aspirational marketing. That shows we've arrived, you know, because they don't ever market Big Macs, you know, like showing like, you know, cholesterol intake or anything like that. They, they just show this Mac, Big Mac is three times higher than the actual Big Mac that you get at McDonald's, right? So anyways, this was developed by the same guys, Whedon and Kennedy, that do Nike ads. They're a major global branding firm. And this was a multi-million dollar campaign to make Oregon the, the global destination for great bicycling and bike travel. So this, to me, is a sign that we are arriving, that bicycling is a serious big business. They've seen those numbers, and they see the potential to market this. So other states are doing this, too. So why the surge in bicycle travel? Now, about half of you have done a bike trip, so I don't know what your reasons are, but you know, is it a diet craze? I was able to, I was able to eat two cronuts this morning <laughs> on our ride. It was, uh, it was disgusting, but, and I ate all the, uh, all the hot fried chicken uh, last night, too. It was, uh, and I still am not, so anyways, but it could be. <laughs> so anyways, it could be this. It could be part of the latest diet craze in America, right? You know, it could be gas prices going up, right? You know, I mean, they are getting back up towards four bucks a gallon. So, you know, those could be, those could be the reasons, right? No, really, uh, we think, but from what we hear from our members and others, you know, why the surge in bicycle travel? It's, you know, it's happiness, it's self-discovery, self-transporting, you know, you use your own power. Uh, community and connection. Let me just show you a few things. These are some of our members around the world. This guy is actually in Turkey. It's a self-time photo, but he looks happy, doesn't he? You know, I mean, he's having a great time. Uh, these two families came through. I gave him the tour of the office. Uh, two families of six, and the dad had just gotten a new military assignment moving from Virginia to Oak Harbor and Whidbey Island in Puget Sound. So they decided to celebrate this by riding six tandem across the country. So they're all having a great time except for the kid on the left. You can see, I don't know, see him? <laughs> uh, but look, I mean, and you get more flexible probably as a cyclist. Look at these women doing ride MS coming through. Uh, these people uh, were doing something in honor of one of the kids' uh, grandparents who had Alzheimer's they were raising money. But again, I mean, how many people on a cruise ship do you see doing that, right? You know, it is a happy, joyful experience. And we get all kinds of people coming through Missoula, Montana. You know, all ages, all ethnicities, all countries of the world all kinds of bikes, all kinds of purposes, but they are coming through because they want to do something transformative in their lives. And for those of you who say that you can't afford to do a bike tour, this is Blaine, we call him Lawnmower Man. And he actually carried this push mower across the entire US and mowed lawns to support his trip. So <laughs> I know, no excuses, you know, you can, you can do it. But really, you know, people are doing it to connect with other cultures. I mean, the bike, as one of our columnists, Willie Weir, has said, is the friendliest vehicle known to humankind. It really is so open, and people want to know where you're coming from, where you're going, what's your story. Uh, so connecting with, connecting with other cultures, connecting with each other. I mean, on my family trips, it's been both cathartic and, and amazing. You know, uh, I'll leave it to your imagination. But this is a photo from our photo contest of a dad and his daughter, you know, on the CNO Canal. And it's just like, there's no bikes in the picture, are there? but it is about that bike trip and that connection you make. Community, anybody know who this woman is? Curry. June Curry, who said that? You said that, well, you, you're an insider, but you still deserve, <laughs> you used to serve the postcards too. June Curry is also known as the Cookie Lady, and she lived on the um, Trans-America Trail in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And the Trans-America Trail is the route we developed back in 1976 as Bike Centennial. So it's kind of evocative for me. We went by the Bicentennial Park today. But June um, realized all these cyclists were riding by on this route and put out her garden hose. And then she realized more cyclists were coming by, so she started making cookies. And she saw more cyclists coming by, and she converted an outbuilding into what she called the bike house. 
And over the years, she hosted over 20,000 cyclists who came through. She just died a couple years ago. So we've named the award the June Curry Trail Angel Award after June. But she's emblematic of the kind of connection people make. She never rode a bike, you know, but biking was her life. The couple I showed you earlier in North Carolina it was very quick, I know, but this is Supinda and that's Kevin Hicks. And they're a couple who really wanted to help kids who were um, having issues in the community that were, didn't have good parenting, didn't have good resources. They called them low-income, high-potential kids. And so they took them on the Underground Railroad route, 2,000-mile trip. None of these kids had ever ridden even one night. So here they are doing like a 60-night trip. And now they're on their fourth trip this summer. It's coming summer. They're going to do their fourth long-distance trip together. But that's uh, Kevin and Supinda up in the left. And these kids, they've been taking out on these amazing bike adventures, and it has completely changed these kids' lives around. And finally, I want to share one other story that I didn't share with the Chattanoogans, because uh, we didn't really have time, but this is Ken and Jen, and I met them a few years ago. And um, they had never done an overnight ride either, but Jen's daughter, her 11-year-old daughter, was hit by a car and killed. And somehow they had the foresight to have her organs donated. Um, and it was a cathartic, moving experience for them, obviously. They lived in, I think, North Carolina, and they decided to ride across the United States to raise money and awareness for organ donor awareness, a nonprofit group that they had worked with. So they got 100 uh, new organ donors, and they used our Transamerica Trail. Uh, they were riding these big rigs. You didn't see Jen's. She has another trailer on it with her chihuahua on it. But the, so they, they clearly weren't planning ahead exactly the way most people would travel light, you know, but they did the whole thing. They did the Trans Am. But they got people to join as organ donors. They raised some money. And then, amazingly, when they were in Colorado, they met this boy with her daughter's heart. Uh, uh, it was an amazing experience. And they had actually given up their home. They were renting a home in North Carolina. They didn't have a ton of money. They just said, let's see where life takes us. And so they've decided to resettle in Colorado and work at a ski lodge. And that winter, they were able to go skiing with that boy and his family. So again, people use bike travel for a lot of different reasons. But community, connection, sometimes catharsis. Something's gone on in your life, and you just need to make that break. But we meet people like this all the time. So if you haven't tried a bike trip, now's the time. The other reason, though, is definitely that feeling of liberation you get. And this is the bike travel porn section, where we have a photo <laughs> contest every year. And these are images from our members. They're not professionals, but let me just show you a few. This is in Iowa. This is Cambodia. Iran. <laughs> Tuscany. They called it our favorite campground. Laos. Yellowstone Lake in uh, Yellowstone National Park. Anybody know where that is? Have you ever seen a picture like that? Everybody takes a reflecting pond, you know, and the Taj in the background. But here, you know, look at the connection again. I mean, look at the kids' faces. I just, uh, that image is great for me. Turkey. Alaska. Yep, I know. I know that's kind of a foreign thing for you, even though you had a little snow this year, right? <laughs> Didn't have that much. Uh, this is Sonoma County. This is about 40 miles north of San Francisco, right above Bodega Bay. It's one of my favorite places to ride. Sudan, New Zealand, and Oregon. This is uh, Cannon Beach, Oregon, near the sea stacks. Really beautiful photo. So, OK, so we know bike tourism makes a lot of money. We know it's an amazing experience. It's accessible to just about anyone. So let me show you the seven steps to better bike tourism and why it matters for you, especially as local advocates. First thing is you want to build and brand those bike facilities. You want to create destinations, OK? I think that's what's happening in Chattanooga. I don't know yet if it's happening in Nashville or Knoxville or Memphis. I do hear great stories about bike facilities going in here and there. But you know, figuring out a way to brand those bike facilities that someone really wants to go there, if they're going on a vacation just for a day to try out that one particular route. Because again, that's where three quarters of the money comes for European bike tourism is from day trips. People go to a place for a week, but they spend the day on a bike, and that is bike tourism. Same could be true for your communities. This is Ripley, Ohio. They decided to take our Underground Railroad route, and then they worked with us to create day loops. So again, 
This is meant to be inclusive. Most of the photos I showed you, the bike travel porn, those are way out there. I know a lot of people aren't going to think about riding on that ice or anything, but just getting them to take that first step for 10 or 20 miles, almost anybody can do that. So this is the Ripley one, and they built it around their heritage as an underground railroad uh, historic site. So they have all these little loops from about 15 miles to 50 miles, and it all cues off the Underground Railroad route. So it's just like river running. You don't do the whole Colorado River probably, right? You just do the choice pieces. You can do the same thing with biking. Number two, you want to build and brand local, regional, and state networks. And this is important because this is where everything hooks together. We want a seamless, integrated system of bike routes in the United States of America and in Canada. This is what they decided to do in Quebec. 2007, they cut the ribbon on La Route Verte. They decided in 1996, the government, the advocacy group said, we are going to build an integrated network. Remember, bikes are a cheap date. Our facilities cost way, way less than you know, building a mile of interstate highway or state highway. Remember, they spent $160 million to build this. In 12 years, look at this, bam, bam, bam. They had all these disaggregated little sections of trail and routes, and in 12 years, they were able to have a seamless integrated 4,000 kilometer network covering the cities with cycle tracks to low traffic volume roads in the hinterlands. So in 12 years they did it, and it's been so popular they've added another 1,000 kilometers in just the last six years. So that's Quebec. So create those networks and make sure they connect from city to suburb to countryside. Connect with the U.S. bicycle route system, and we had that great presentation on USBR 23, thanks to these two guys and many others, Bruce and David right here. And we're trying to get that presentation videotaped, too, so we can share it with other states. They can see how well they did, but USBR 23. Michigan right now is really advancing the game. They've got two U.S. bike routes, 20 and 35. They did just what these guys did. They got resolutions of support from all the communities along the way. So it's bottoms up, top down. It's a U.S. bicycle route, so you got the national imprimatur, but then you also have local buy-in. You're on a U.S. bike route now. Are you going to promote it? Are you going to support it? Are you going to make sure your roads are in good condition for visiting cyclists? Are you going to try and provide more bike racks, maybe? There are no, there are no requirements that they do that, but they've got to start thinking that way. So connecting with that U.S. bike route system will also get you more exposure with your DOT. I'm really pleased. Um, that Tennessee's DOT is helping support this. But this was a, a slider on the uh, Florida Department of Transportation's website, so you guys could do that too. Uh, FDOT prepares for U.S. bike routes. So here it is. We've got a progress sheet that you can access on the website. 41 states are doing this now, including Tennessee. 12 new U.S. bike routes are approved, including USBR 23. Uh, five new ones are going to be approved at the end of May, and more and more and more are going to snowball. Again, this is a competitive field now. So there's also a best practices guide available if you want to do U.S. bike routes. In the future, this is going to be the largest official cycling network on the planet. It's going to be huge. It's going to be 50, 60, 70,000 miles. And I'm really pleased to announce also today, along with Jessica, we just got the okay, that TDOT and the Nashville MPO have agreed to sign, pay for the signage of all of U.S. Bike Route 23. So they really deserve... <laughs> Around the clock. This is this is the first this is the first partnership. So as we amend that best practices guide, we will put Tennessee into the mix. Okay, so just a few more, and then um, we'll be done. Number four is connect with, educate, and utilize tourism and economic development agencies. So remember, you saw that Oregon ad. Once you get in the tourism bureaus, you are gold if you work it right. They have so much money. They have way more money, and if they think that you are profitable you're going to get way more attention from them than probably your DOT or your local transportation agency. Louisiana has done an excellent website for all kinds of users. So I, I would encourage you to look at that one, but there are other websites coming on. Oregon, I hate just going to Oregon, but they have an excellent website called Ride Oregon Ride. Five, capture and connect with bike tourism interests. I'd show you this video, but we already saw the other one. This is Minnesota. Actually, Pedal Minnesota, this website, is supported by health, um, like hospitals and the um, National Resource, Natural Resources Agency and DOT. So they've got a lot of interest promoting Minnesota as the bike friendliest state. Um, and I love this, uh, it's a screenshot from their video, we measure vacations in pedal strokes. And it's very inclusive. They have all sizes of people, all kinds of people, all ages in that video. 
I really encourage you to check out Pedal Minnesota and look at it because it's so inclusive. It's really wonderful. It's not hard body cyclists because I think that is what scares people away sometimes is do I have to wear a Lycra? And no, you don't have to wear a Lycra. You know, it's wear some regular shorts. And then we have a partnership with National Park Service too. That's John Jarvis on the right with me and Ginny Sullivan, our Director of Travel Initiatives, who's in a dynamo. Um, she's just an amazing person to work with. But we have an uh, agreement with them to promote more cycling to and through the national parks. Check that out too. Natchez Trace is one of our primary partners right now to get more biking in the trace. So last two items, number six, cross, develop, promote, and cross-pollinate all types of bike tourism. I've said this several times, but the day tours are key. Use your bike sharing. 30% of the revenue in the capital in DC is from tourists using their bike share. They are making money by using that bike share. It's not just for locals. The bike overnights, events, mountain bike destinations. Mountain bike destinations are a big deal. Um, Bikeovernights.org is a website you can go to. We run it and we have loads of stories of people who are doing bike overnights. And I encourage you to look at it because the biggest category is families doing 10, 20, 30 mile rides. And it's amazing. I mean, this is the way that you can get your kids out and enjoying a bike tour. So bikeovernights.org, here's the actual website. It's global too. This is actually a story from Rock and Pillar Range in New Zealand. It's a mountain biking overnight. And it's getting good media too. This was a great story I ran a little while ago in the New York Times on bike vacations offer freedom and frugality. Okay, so that's bike overnights. They're a great way, a great entryway, and they spur local tourism. They spur local tourism. So, you know, you can get people just out of your town of Nashville, 20 or 30 miles, you could take transit to the edge, take your car to the edge, and then do that 20 or 30 mile trip. And then finally, conduct and disseminate the research on economic and community impacts of bike tourism. So we worked with the University of Montana on our study. It was really cheap to do. But all this is available at Building Bike Tourism. It's a page on our website. So you can get all the links to these studies. You can get background information, videos. You can get it all there. So for you guys, as advocates or even agency officials, it creates this virtuous cycle. You start with the facilities and networks. You combine it with local serving transportation. It's a win-win situation. It's a win-win situation where you, you can actually support local commuters and then also provide those facilities for visitors. And let me just show, which yields the money, which yields the visibility, which comes back into your whole system. As you get more popular, as people see biking is more popular, kaboom. And this is for it for traveling and everyday cyclists, and it's good for local and state businesses. So that's it. The power of bicycle travel is already here. It's growing. It's an opportunity for Tennessee and your neighboring states to really pursue an economic engine, but also pursue something that is going to be great for you and great for your communities. Thanks very much.